Well, it is so good to see everybody today. Uh, if you are joining us this morning on the live stream, let's give all of our folks joining us on the live stream a, a great welcome. All oh, you can do better than that. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm adjusting the privacy settings real quick since all of that is on my page. I'm so grateful that you're here and I'm so grateful that you're joining us on the live stream. We have missed you and uh, we did have a great vacation. I tell you something you can be in prayer with us about is Sarah is due any day. Yeah, twin babies, a boy and a girl. Uh, they're going to call the babies, you know, Casey's a big Star Wars, and and J and Jake, our three-year-old, he's a big Star Wars guy, and they, they believe they're naming the two children, legally they're naming the two children Miles and Maddie, but we're going to call them Luke and Leia, okay? So, it's grandparents' rights, people. Come on, it's just grandparents' rights, and if you don't like it, well, then that's just too bad. But anyhow, we're going to go ahead and receive our, our online tithes and offerings. You can go and you can give to lifechurchlouisville.com and there's a there's the website there's a link at the top of the page and you can give there or you can mail some to the church life church louisville 4413 these pages lane louisville kentucky 40272 and i want to thank uh, uh chris Berger. you know it's 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 hard to come back after chris has preached because chris just brings the house down yeah. you get chris Maybe we just need to go on vacation more. You get Chris one week, and then you get me the next. So, you know, that's what it is. But I, uh, we watched the live stream. Chris did a fantastic job. The only thing on the live stream that I really started honing in on was when Sean and Danny came up to, at the end to close out the service. Sean said he's going to sing. And so we're in floor. I'm, I'm like, Michelle, come here. Sean's going to sing. This is going to be good. <laughs> and then Jeremy cut the live stream. I'm like, well, Lord, that may be to our good, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyhow, so the, uh, I'm just so grateful for Chris and that, that he spoke. We thank you very much. And uh, the last announcement that I want to make before I jump into anything else is Easter is in two weeks. And we're going to have a great service here at the church. And uh, we want you to invite your family and friends to be with us. We're going to have a great, great, great morning. I know that celebrating the resurrection of our Lord, Jesus, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, before I jump into the message, I want to say hello to a couple people and I'd like you to help me. Uh, I have some heroes here today and that's the Trout family. We love you all. And we appreciate you allowing us to serve you as a church. You guys are incredible. And uh, we honor you, just point blank. We, we, we honor you. So thank you for being with us today. Let me pray and refocus myself so that way we can jump into what I have on my heart this morning that I want to share with you. Jesus, we, we need you today. Father, I pray, God, that you would allow your word to just uh, absorb into our spirits and, Father, become a part of who we are. Lord, I thank you, God, for a place like Life Church Louisville that we can operate in freedom. We can be real. We don't have to fake it until we make it. Lord, I thank you, God, that you meet us right where we are at all levels of our faith, at all levels of our life, at all levels of our struggle. And Jesus, we thank you for that. And everybody said, Amen. this morning I want to talk about our theme for the year so far has been focusing. And I want to talk about uh, focusing again. Sarah and Casey, our son and our daughter and son-in-law, they are professional photographers. Uh, they are so good. They're just incredible at what they do. As a matter of fact, this month, they have been featured in Kentucky Bridal Magazine, and they've done a feature on them. That, they're just unbelievable photographers. And so I was asking her one day, because they've got all this expensive equipment. I mean, photography equipment is just ridiculous. Lenses, a lens can cost you $8,000, a lens. A piece of plastic, metal, and glass cost you eight thousand. You know, it's just nuts. And so I was just talking to her one day. I'm like, "Well, what? How do you, how do you know you're getting a good shot?" And she said, "Well, you've got to have the right equipment. You've got to have the right subject. You have to have the right lighting. You have to have all this stuff." And she said, "The most important thing you have to do is you have to remain in focus." You know, I could take a picture of my wife, and I took I took a lot of pictures of my wife while we were on vacation. It's just one of the things that we do, and it doesn't matter. And right at the beach. White sands, crystal clear water. How many are hating me so far? There you go. 
Yeah. Uh, she, she was standing on this street on Rosemary Beach, and she had a cup of coffee. My wife has picked up a very evil habit while we're on vacation. She's a coffee a coffee drinker now. And so whatever. She, she, she's got this habit. So... It used to be she could just walk through the aisle at Kroger and smell. Now she's got to go buy this. Anyhow, so she said, you want some? I'm like, no, I've got enough bad habits. So uh, I took this picture and I fell in love with it. But the problem was it was out of focus. I had a beautiful subject in a beautiful setting, but because it was out of focus and I didn't see clearly, then the picture that I took was worthless. So lucky for me, I would actually had another one was able to use it. But you know what, friends? Oftentimes in life, I don't know about you, but we lose our focus. And as a church, listen, it can be, uh, if we're not careful, it can be success can cause us to lose our focus. Come on. Uh, a change of jobs can cause you to lose your focus. Having babies can cause you to lose your focus. Buying a new house, going through a storm, whatever it is. Friends, we can lose our focus. We all suffer from ADHD, ADD, don't we? Okay. How, 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 many, how many of you use a remote at the house on your TV? Okay. How many watch one channel? Exactly. So you got my point. So let me read this to you. It's Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. This is what we're going to talk about this morning is focus. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, Paul the Apostle. He's writing to the church in Ephesus, okay? And he says, I'm kneeling before the Father, whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of this glorious, out of his glorious riches, that he may what? Strengthen you with his power through his spirit. Understand, God's in heaven. Jesus is on the right hand of the Father, but the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And he lives inside of us to be our helper. He comes to give us strength, okay, in our inner being, in our spirit man, okay? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Everyone say through faith. That's important, okay? And I pray that you being rooted and established in what? The number one place where we lose our focus, church, is not loving right. I'll just be honest with you, okay? Uh, how many know love is blind? H how many men in here, you've been in love? Only two? How many are married? <laughs> wow, we have real problems now, okay? <laughs> We're going to start over because we got some problems here. Okay, let me ask this again. How many married men here have been in love before? Okay. <laughs> We're still not there. We've only got half of the married men raising their hands. I'm not talking about now. I'm talking about maybe, in the, never mind. The pro <laughs> Let me pray again. Oh, Lord. <laughs> when Michelle and I were dating and we were engaged to be married, there were some times where the love that I had for her blinded me and her to each other's flaws. And you make excuses for each other's behavior because you choose not to recognize those flaws. How many know exactly what I'm talking about? And all the women in the house said, Amen. so anyhow, <laughs> rooted and established in love, okay? Now, this love is just not butterflies and goosebumps, okay? This means a whole lot more than that, all right? So that you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, and how high the deep of the deep is the deep is the love of Christ. Understand, we have to understand something. God loves at all times. Why? It's not that God makes love, God is love. So he can't do anything but love. We may not understand his what what's taking place, but through it all, God still loves. Okay? Michelle and I may argue. We may have an argument. And believe me, sometimes we have arguments. Sometimes, thank God we have arguments in the privacy of our homes, because if you saw some of the arguments we had, you'd say, You're a pastor. <laughs> okay, I'm just keeping it real. That's how it is. Because we're people first. All right? And, and, and so um, we have to understand that even though we still have an argument, there's still love. All right, let's go on. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God. Okay, that is huge. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us, to him and only him be the glory in the church 
in the church. Everyone say in the church. Because we're going to talk about the church here in just a few minutes, okay? Because what God wants, let me back up just a little bit. God wants to do more than we can ever imagine. He wants to work in the church, in us through his power. So that way he gets the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. Okay? Forever and ever. Amen. When I grew up, I grew up in a blue-collar neighborhood not too far from here. My dad was a blue-collar worker. I, I, my neighborhood was Catholic. How many Catholics we have? Say amen. <laughs> They're about at the same level as the men who admitted they'd been in love. But anyhow, we, I grew up in a great neighborhood. Had a lot of friends. Had a lot of connections. Had a lot of people that... that I became friends with, that I went to school with. I went to Catholic school, so I had known the people that I had, were friends with basically from the time I was six years old all the, time, all the way to I graduated high school, tw a long time. And so the thing about it is, is that when we moved into this neighborhood, everything was wonderful. Everything was great. Everything was fantastic for the first couple of years. And then all of a sudden, it just seems like the wheels came off in our neighborhood. I can't put my thumb on it. I can't figure it out. But it's like everything just kind of, un, un, just kind of fell apart in the neighborhood. Just give you a few examples, okay? Someone uh, stripped my mom and dad's car. The kids behind us, they were left to themselves all the time. And so they were just wheels off, did whatever they wanted to do. Uh, the, the, there, was, there was one guy who lived next door to us who loved to party. And when his mom and dad went out of town, and he was, a, he was a pothead. And he would have parties at his house, and hundreds of people, literally hundreds of people would come. And at one time, there'd be at least 100 people in the backyard smoking pot. And my mom walked in the house one night and she said, is it possible for a dog to get a contact high from a party next door? Because our dogs just lay down on the patio. It's a legit question. His father died of a heart attack. Within two weeks of that, two people committed suicide and then a man was killed in an explosion. And so my mom began to realize, you know what? My neighborhood is under, there's something going on here. And being a believer in our neighborhood, we've got to make a difference here. Being a believer in the neighborhood, there's got to be something that I do that changes, that addresses what's going on in the neighborhood. So my mom, what she began to do was pray. And while walk, I mean, listen, my mother was one of those radical, charismatic Pentecostal type people and when she got saved she got saved to the bone and so my mother knew no boundaries to this day she kind of knows no boundaries but anyhow she would walk through the neighborhood and pray out loud for the people in the houses that she was walking by I pray for so and so and so and so God I pray that you help their marriage I pray that you bless their kids I pray their kids wouldn't be so crazy I pray their dog wouldn't bark all night long I pray I pray and then she'd go to the next house that's just what she did she would pray that my mother was a radical that way. And then she got some friends who believed the same way she did, and they started coming to our house on Thursday nights, and we would have intercessory prayer meetings at the house in our living room with the windows open. And you've got seven, eight women who were wailing and praying in our living room. And then the sun would go down, and I'd walk in the living room around these people who were praying and close the curtains. Because I don't know about you, but when we're on vacation, one of the things that Michelle loves to do is go house stalking after dark. How I many know exactly what I'm talking about? She'll like, let's go, th go through the rich neighborhoods and w after dark when they've got their lights on so we can see how they're decorated. I'm like, you are wrong. And then she broke into a house one time, a $9 million house. I'm like, hey, let's just go drive by. So I, w I was embarrassed because this is what's happening. My mom and dad are, my mom and her friends are walking the floor and they're praying out loud for the problems in the neighborhood and people are starting to walk the sidewalks to see what's going on in our house. Because my mother, is, she's just interceding for our neighborhood. And then finally, I, 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 rode the, I rode the high school with the guy who lived next door to me. And we would ride to high school, and he would turn on Molly Hatchet and Errol Smith. And it was cool riding to school with him because he had a great sound system. And then he started realizing what was taking place in my house. And I got in the car one day expecting Errol Smith and uh, Molly Hatchet or the police or whatever. And the radio was off. And I looked at him, I'm like, 
like, we're not going to listen to the radio today. He's like, no, I've got some questions for you. <laughs> I'm like, okay, what are they? He says, what, 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 what is going on in your house on Thursday nights? And I'm like, can we please, let's listen to ACDC, because I did not want to answer those questions. <laughs> And finally, I told him, I said, my mom and dad are born-again Christians. And he says, so I guess that makes you a born-again Christian, aren't you? And I'm like, it does. And friends, that was the most awkward, silent ride to school that I ever had until the following day. And it just got kind of out of hand. And then it, it, it got worse because my mother would stand in the living room praying for the pothead neighbor next door. And then my mother would start praying for the man's wife, who was now a widow, who had had her, by name, by name. I'm like, Mom, just pray, but don't call their names. They're listening. They can hear you. And so Mom was the type of person who, her, her way of connecting with people, believe it or not, was taking food to them. I had a girl who beat me up. I had a girl who, you remember me telling the story, I had a girl, Lori Skaggs, I, I, beat me up. <laughs> I go to the bathroom to get the blood off of my face and come out of the bathroom and she's sitting in the dining room at the table drinking a Coke with my mother. I'm like, no, what the heck is going on? And my mother's just, I'm trying to be kind to her. She, she beat you up. Maybe I can be kind to her. I'm like, be kind to me. <laughs> so my mom's like, I need to reach the pothead next door. What, a, what, what kind of food does he like? <laughs> Cookies and brownies, mom. Cookies and brownies. And so she baked brownies. And she went and knocked on his door. And she said, hey, I just, I wanted to give you these with the love, in the love of Jesus. And, oh, no, she made me take them over there. And he, he opens the door and I'm like, from my mom. But listen to me. As the more my mother would pray, the more things would change. That's the key. As funny as all of that is, the more my mother would pray for the situation in our neighborhood, the more things would change. One morning, a girl, young girl who was trapped in human trafficking knocked on our door at 7.45 a.m. needing help, and something drew her to our house. And she was separated from her mother who lived in Seattle, and my mom and dad bought her a bus ticket to get home. And that happened not only once, but that happened twice with two different people. Things began to change. All of the kids started hanging out at our house. People would, would, would come to the house and just talk with my parents, or people would talk to them at the... We used, at one point, we were the outcast, the oddball, the weirdo, and then all of a sudden, now everybody... Have, there's something that's drawing them to us. I'll never forget my mom and dad threw a graduation party for me, and we've got this big party at the house, and one of my mom and dad's friends, her, she used to come to church here, she was was a radical Pentecostal, wasn't afraid to tell anybody about Jesus. She pulls down the street, trying to find a place to park on the street, pulls in the man's driveway a couple of houses down. He's out watering his lawn. She parks his, her car, and then she walks down the street, and she walks up to him, and she says, I just want to thank you for allowing me to turn around in your driveway. By the way, do you know, do you know Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Are you going to heaven? And she led the man to the Lord on his lawn with a hose. But that was a result because my mom and dad prayed for our community. And friends, listen to me. As a church, there's nothing more powerful that we can't do, that we can do is to come together and pray. And so let me talk about that. What caused our neighborhood to change? What caused our community to change? Well, the first thing was we pray, okay? Everyone say prayer. Prayer works, all right? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. And what's he doing? For whom every family in heaven and earth derives his name, and I pray. Church, listen, if we want to see things change, then we've got to pray, all right? My parents loved our neighborhood, and so they prayed for it. They prayed for it passionately. They didn't get angry and move out. They didn't get frustrated with this situation and gossip about it and condemn about it and separate themselves. No, they prayed. And it's interesting because I believe the more we pray for communities, the more we pray for people, the more change that we experience in their life. Listen to me, guys. 
listen to me, I want you to get this. For those of you who said you didn't know if you've been in love before, perhaps your marriage is struggling right now. I want to tell you, you go to counseling, you can get involved in CR, you can come and jump in a small group. Michelle and I will sit down with you. Other people will sit down. And, but I'm going to tell you, the number one way to get your marriage back on track is that you've got to pray together. You have to. Now, this is the piece of where I'm going. And this actually, it's a very small piece. But I want you to understand as the foundation of this, Paul says, I pray. Okay? So if we want to see our community change, we want to see things change, we've got to pray. Then, and it says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, that he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being. Okay? That's what Paul is saying. Our community changed because the Holy Spirit was real in our house. Do you know why the community is drawn to Life Church Louisville? Because we we pray and the Holy Spirit draws them here. They don't come here because of the preaching. They don't come here because of the video worship. I can't wait to get the worship team back on the platform. They come because they're drawn here. Listen, they come because there's something different about Life Church Louisville. And I'm not saying there's not something different about other churches. We have a very specific DNA, and God brings those people who are looking for that DNA here, okay? You all wouldn't fit in other churches. I'm just telling you, I've been to some of them. <laughs> Say amen or something. Amen. The next thing is we walk by faith. Everyone say walk by faith. Walk by faith. Paul says so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through what? Faith. Through faith. Listen, do you always feel it? I mean, let's be honest. Okay, listen, all the guys who said, you know, I don't know if I love, I don't know about the love thing. The, the reason why you probably answered that way is because, guys, you're more emotional than what you want to live into. And probably the reason why you answered the way you did is because you don't always feel in love with your wife. Guess what? I don't either. <laughs> he said it, not me. Do I always feel like serving God? Let's just be honest. Can I be honest with you? Don't you, don't you just want to quit sometimes? Don't you just want to say, I can't believe this has happened to me. You know what? Screw God. I'm just going to go do my own thing for a while. I mean, there have been days. And listen, the people who won't tell you that they believe that way or they've operated that way or they felt that way, guess what they're doing? They're lying. Because we all waver in our faith at some days. But Paul says, you know what? We need to walk by faith, okay? Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. Listen, we built a household of faith. And how do you build faith? Well, you stay in the word of God. My mother was such a radical. She would take postcards. She would take note cards and write scriptures out and tape the same scripture all over the house in the refrigerator, on the mirror, in the bathroom. And listen, every week we learn a, re a new scripture. And so the reason why we have faith to make it through the storms is of life is because we had the word of faith put inside of us. Now what activates that thing is prayer. But the thing that instills it inside of us is getting in God's word, okay? I'll never forget, my mom and dad, sometimes they would come to get us, wake us up for church. And I hated going to church. We, went, we were going, this is when we were going to church with, with Gail years ago at Deeper Life. And my mom and dad would say, come on, it's time to get up for church. And I'm like, I'm sick. I don't feel like going. And my mom say, okay, I'll be right back. She'd go up and get the Crisco and she'd come down to anoint my head with oil and say, in Jesus' name be healed. By his stripes you were healed. Get out of bed. You're going to church. <laughs> and then when I got to church, guess who else is going to pray for me? The pastor. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. We made excuses. But listen to me. Most everything that we do here at Life Church stems from how I was raised. The Dream Center, we feed the hungry. We love the poor. Why? Because I was raised to feed the hungry. I was raised to love the poor. I was raised to feed the drug addict. I, even if it was just brownies, I was raised to love people who are different than me. The Angel Tree, we help people at Christmas time. We do the same here at the church. We loved, we were taught to love because Christ loved us first. And that's just as simple as it was. And so what's the last thing before I jump into something else? Love. We were taught how to love. Bottom line. So that way Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled. That you can be complete. See, love is what completes us. The love of the Father is what completes us. And friends, we had a house that was built on love. Now, 
I've often questioned how, can, how come the church doesn't always operate this way. In the 1980s, when we started really going to church, you went to church. The number one question I get about Life Church Louisville is, what do I have to wear? And it's a legitimate question. And when you tell people that you wear jeans and a pullover or a button down, they, they, they have a hard time with that. But in the 80s, when you went to church, when I started really going to church, you went in a coat and tie. In the 80s, you carried a big Bible and a marker. And it was usually in some kind of zip-up Bible thing with a cross on the front of it to make you look real spiritual. <laughs> it was all, listen, it was all about image. It was all about, watch this, it was all about faking it in front of everybody else until you made it. And see, that culture has creeped in and tries to predominate the church today. And friends, we refuse to let it be that way because we're not going to fake anything until we make anything. I want to show you a couple, I want to show you a couple of pictures real quick before I go on. This is my family. The only people that are missing from this, fam, that from this picture, this was a picture that we took at my grandmother's funeral. It was the last time all of us were together. And all of us are not in this picture. Josh is not in this picture. Uh, Natalie's not in this picture. Oliver wasn't even born yet. Uh, my brother Jonathan, uh, my brother Jonathan is in this picture. His wife, he's right here. My brother Jonathan, his wife didn't come and their other five kids didn't come. So this is all of us. That's a great picture. And the only perfect person in that picture is Jake. Let me get to this other picture. This is at Sarah's wedding. Isn't that a great picture? You would sit and look at that picture and say, that's a perfect family. That's a beautiful family. And that family has it together. That's my family. But I want to show you something. The perfection ends where the clothes end. Because we are as jacked up as a family as it comes. And see, I've not shared all of my story. I've shared a piece of my story. But I think you have to understand, friends, that we can portray an image. And when you see that image, you can think, you know what? That, that family has money. That family is well put together. Everybody's happy. Everybody gets along. They're Christians. They must really have their act together. And I'll be honest with you, friends. All five of my brothers and sisters, Toby, uh, Renee, they're, Toby's in full-time ministry in Ohio. Renee, her and her husband passed her church in Bowling Green. Uh, Megan, her and her, her husband, Jeff, they're pastors, uh, youth pa uh, children's pastors in Dallas. And my brother, who's not in this picture, is a children's pastor in Kansas City. My mom and dad are in ministry in their church. We've all got it together. We, we must have it together because we're in ministry. Listen to me. I want to tell you something. One of the number one prerequisites of being in ministry is not having it all together. And let me explain why to you. My grandmother, who is in this picture, who's passed, was not a perfect person. My grandmother could not bear children. My grandmother had controlling issues. My grandmother ha had been abused. My grandmother had been uh, pushed down by her dad. That woman had some baggage in her past. My mother, who is the woman right here, grew up in an orphanage. Her parents abandoned her. My mother grew up with deep insecurities and trust issues. And she allowed people to do evil things to her because she didn't know any better. She was too young. And so my mother grew up with tons and tons and tons of baggage. My mother began to be controlling because she walked in great fear. And out of that, she married my father, my biological father, divorced him because he beat me and left him. Thank God she married that man right there who is an unbelievable father to me and taught me how to pray and taught me how to walk with the Lord. But even he had issues. He drank too much. 
His father was an orphan. His father didn't know how to show love, so my dad didn't know how to show love. If my dad needed a tool, if my dad was working on a car, he needed a tool, he'd tell you what to get him, and I'm, I'm nine years old. I don't know what a 3-8 socket wrench looks like, so he would scream at me until I got it. That's just, that's where he was until he found the Lord. My brother was born with special needs. My brother taxed my parents to the nth degree. My sister was born with major health issues. My brother lost his daughter at six months to a terrible heart disease. My sister was sexually abused by her pastor. All of us are as messed up as it comes. Hold on, I'm going to give you some hope here in a minute. But friends, when people look at this picture, they're saying, that family's got it all together. I want to tell you, let me, can, I, um, can, can I let you in a little bit, a little bit closer? might make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. I have a sister right now who's not speaking to me, and we're Christians. <laughs> Come on. You, for those of you who are new here, we just keep it real. She's got her feelings hurt. Need, needs to be made right. She's not just not speaking to me. She's not speaking to any of us. So we got to make it right. So let me, let me pull it back on me. I'm insecure. I chase success, approval. I have abandonment issues. Well, of course I do. My, my biological father walked out. People walk out. I've lost jobs. I'm impatient. Michelle says I can be controlling. <laughs> she says I talk too long. My stories ramble. But let me tell you about her. <laughs> Girlfriend, the Bible says we're one flesh, so we're in the same land together, so take that. She had issues. She had security issues. She had a learning issue. She, she struggles with reading. Now, she can do Chinese arithmetic backwards and forwards, but sometimes getting the Bible out and understanding, like, it takes her longer than it does some, some people. And she, she has shared that from this platform. She struggles with that. She struggles with sometimes being a little bit overbearing. But watch this, friends. All of us are in full-time ministry, and it's not because of our qualifications, but it's because we understand what real hurt really is all about. Because what I realize is this, is that God uses your hurt more than he does what you have in your head when it comes to ministering to other people. Let me prove it to you, okay? Number one, I tell you all that to say this, okay? We all have wounds. Every one of us have wounds. Every one of us have been hurt. Every one of us have been walked out on. Every one of us have been disappointed. Every one of us sitting in this room have had somebody who's hurt us. And you want to know something? Most of the time, it's the people that we're close to. Most of the time, it's our family. Most of, listen, nobody on this planet has hurt me worse than Michelle. And nobody on this planet has hurt her worse than me. But you want to know something? We love each other deeply. And we're committed to the covenant that we made. And we've refused to give up on that. So there's, a, there's wounds. My parents, you know what? I can blame a lot of things because my parents didn't, my parents didn't always do what I felt like they should do. You know, we can blame a lot of things on other people. But the thing is, is this, is we all are wounded people. Listen, I've had people who call me on the phone, Pastor Pat, I just can't, I'm not coming back to Life Church. Well, why? Because I got my feelings hurt. Somebody's wounded me. I get it. I understand it. I'm quitting the softball team. Why? Because the coach yelled at me. I had a guy who was playing for Rick Pitino once. Rick Pitino. A guy was playing for Rick Pitino. Blackshear. Won a national championship with U of O. Then got it taken away. But anyhow, played basketball. Wayne called me one day. He's like, I want to quit. I'm like, why? Because Pitino won't stop screaming at me. I'm like, he recruited you. You knew what kind of coach he was. You're getting your feelings hurt because the coach yelled at you? Boy, you need some real therapy there. He stuck with the team, won a national championship with them. 
wounds. We all have wounds, friends. Some of the times, though, we create our own wounds, don't we? But you know what the great thing about wounds is? Is that Jesus heals. Okay? That, that's the great thing. Listen, Jesus wants us to bring our wounds to him so that way he can heal them, not hide them, not cover them up. Why did I sit and give you all the garbage about my family? Because we're very transparent, we're very real, because if God can heal, if God can restore, if God can meet me where I am with all of my garbage, but yet still use me, still use my wife and I, our kids and our family, right now this this Sunday morning, all five, oh, excuse me, three of my brothers and sisters are preaching this morning, all but one, as jacked up and sideways as we are, God chooses to use the wounded, the broken, and the messed up because why? Nobody out there is perfect. In the church for too long, we created this mantra that we were perfect. And you know what? You had to clean yourself up and be like us before you can get to us. And I want to tell you something, friends. Jesus Christ despises that message. And he says, come, come who are broken. Come who are messed up. Come who are, who, who are, are just had their, their spirits crushed. I, 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 Jesus comes for those people. And I love this story, friends. Matthew chapter 12, verse 9. Going on from the place... Jesus went to their synagogue. Jesus went to church. Watch this. Jesus went to church. And a man with a shriveled hand was there. He's in church. Now, you and I wouldn't think anything of this, but back in those days, if there was something wrong with you physically, you weren't, you weren't welcome at church. Adam and Kim and Gail and Michelle and I went into a church not long ago on a Sunday morning. And we walk in, we sit down. I don't know anybody there. But instantly, I knew who the religious people were. Do you know why? Because one of the women, she just kind of... Friends, she wasn't looking up the pastor, the, the text the pastor was preaching. She was telling some other people, we got, we got people here, and they're not like us. I felt awkward. Wouldn't you? Here's this man. He's, he's shamed. He's an outcast. He's shamed because of his hand. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. Jesus is in church with all the religious people who act like they're better than everybody else. And Jesus walks up to the man, the man who can heal this man's life, who can heal his hand. Jesus walks up to him in front of all those religious people and says, hey, stretch out your hand. Stretch out your hand. Listen, it's interesting. Jesus doesn't tell him which hand to stretch out. He just said, stretch out your hand. Now, you know, I don't, I don't know about you, but uh, if I were in that situation, I'm going to put out my good hand. Because I don't want anybody to know that I messed up. I'm afraid I'm going to be judged. I, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm afraid that I'm going to be an outcast. But Jesus didn't ask him which hand. But here's the thing. But if he put out his good hand, he would have missed the whole point of the moment. Jesus, Jesus wasn't trying to heal his good hand. Jesus came for his bad hand. We can't expect Jesus to heal what we're afraid to reveal. We, we can't expect Jesus to heal what we hide. Why am I so transparent about my life? Because most 95% of all the garbage that I walk through in my life, Jesus has either forgiven me from, has healed me from, or has, you, has moved me on from. And so what I do when I go to the Father is I confess my garbage to him. He already knows it anyway. I confess who I am to him so that way I have nothing to hide. Listen, we are as only as sick as our secrets. And friends, God can't. God cannot heal what we refuse to reveal. There is power in the point of our vulnerability. In the church that I grew up in, that man would have put his good hand out and his bad hand in his pocket. But healing doesn't come from what we hide. Watch this. Healing comes from the moment you decide that your belief in Jesus as your healer becomes greater than the shame that you feel about yourself. 
Please take a picture of that. Please write that down. Because watch this. Look at me for just a second. Some of us, we're afraid to allow Jesus in to do anything with us because our shame keeps us from Jesus. Our shame and our guilt from our past keep us from coming to him. Our shame from the emotion that we've walked through because of pain and suffering and injustice kind of keep us from Jesus because somewhere, somehow, we created a church, we created a Jesus that we must be perfect to approach him. But the Bible says this, that we we boldly approach his throne of what? Of grace. That means whatever condition I'm in, no matter how messed up I may be, no matter how bad of a day that I've had, no matter how bad of a storm I've walked through, no matter how messed up sideways it gets, I can always go to my father and say, God, here's my shriveled hand right next to my bad hand. Heal me in Jesus' name. And you know what? He doesn't judge me for it. Can I be honest with you? I go to the Father sometimes with the same thing. God, I lost my temper today. God, I lost my temper again today. God, I lost my temper again today. God, I'm going to stay off of Dixie Highway. <laughs> God, I lost my temper today on the Gene Snyder. God, I was speeding again today. I mean, I'll go to the Lord about 15 times in, in two hours about speeding. God, I was speeding again. Lord, I lost my patience with my wife again. Lord, I'm frustrated with my wife again. Lord, I'm frustrated with myself again. You know what? I go to the Father and I process those things all the time. And you know what? Never, ever once do I go lower on his scale of love. It always maintains the same level. God's love for me is not predicated on my behavior, but it's on the work that Jesus did on the cross. Thank God. And I may not feel it, I don't deserve it. Healing comes in the moment you decide that your belief in Jesus as your healer becomes greater than the shame you feel about yourself. Therefore, I will not be ashamed to extend all of me that is broken because I want to be healed. And the last thing is this. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched out his hand. He revealed the weakness. He revealed the hurt. He revealed the pain. He revealed all that he had walked through and said, here it is, Lord. And it was completely restored. Completely. Just as the other. And the last thing is this. Scars. Man, anybody got any scars? I've got one here, I've got one here, I've got one here, I've got two here. I was in the, sitting down last night, Michelle walked in, she was putting Clinique moisturizer on her face. And she looked at my head because it's peeling, bald head issue after you've been out in the sun. And she says, come here, honey. She's putting this Clinique lotion on my head it looks it looks awful it just looks awful you're peeling you're flaking doesn't it hurt <laughs> scars some of the deepest wounds we will ever 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 receive leave a scar but you know what scars do you ready for this Your scars become your story. I was broken. I was damaged. I was hurt. I was wounded. I was betrayed. I was disappointed. But God met me where I was and said, I love you. I, I understand that. I'm sorry that that happened to you. I'm sorry that person betrayed you. I'm sorry that person lied to you. I'm sorry that person did that to your family. I'm sorry. But at the same time, he offers healing. And you know what I told somebody the other day? Actually, I didn't tell. I, I heard this, and I, then I told somebody. I was watching some preacher on TV. He had dreadlocks. He, the dreadlocks caught my attention. 
And he said, your scars are your street cred. Your scars are your credibility. Because if I can't identify with your pain, if I can't identify with your hunger, and then I will never be able to meet you in the gutter, in the hell, in the hurt, in the storm. If I've not been there myself, I can't show you how to get out. If I've not been there myself, I can't walk through you in the middle of it. If I've not been there myself. And friends, I'm telling you something. Jesus healed my heart, my spirit. And if he can do that for me and you'll let him, he'll do it for you. And here's what happens. Jesus is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work inside of us. And friends, I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what your background is. I don't know what you're walking through. I don't know, I don't know where you are. But I do know this, is that we refuse to create a church to where the most broken, messed up person can't walk through that back door and say something feels different about this place. They may not understand the music. They may not understand the way we do things. They, they may not be able to identify with the function as long as they uh, identify with the spirit that's in this place. Would you allow me to pray for you this morning? Father, every one of us in this room have been just through hell. But Father, you meet us in our hurt. You meet us in our disappointments. You meet us at our failure. And the great thing is, is you allow us to expose it without condemnation, without guilt, without judgment. And you heal us. Father, there are people here today, Father, who, who've been wounded, who have had no fault of their own, Jesus. But God, I pray that you meet us here today, Jesus. Father, we need you so much. Our community needs you so much. Our world is falling apart, and God, a politician is not going to save us. Only you can save us. Father, I pray for the daughter today who's lost her best friend. God, I pray today for the wife whose husband's just walked out on her. God, I pray for my friend who just lost his job. We pray for our friends here that have just lost a daughter. I pray for that mama who just lost her baby. I pray for that girl who tried to commit suicide last night. Father, I pray for those who've been left and abandoned. I pray for those who've been rejected and betrayed. But Father, we just know that you are willing, you are able, you are wanting to come into all the situations that we've just mentioned and bring beautiful healing. And then out of that healing comes a purpose. God, may the church never forget where we came from. May we never forget the pain and the hurt that we came from. And Father, may we never forget to use our scars to point people to hope. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Listen, we thank you for joining us on the live stream today. Uh, thank you for being with us. Listen, if you have any questions, if, if anything that we said spoke to you today, reach out to us on Facebook. Send us a Facebook message. We want to be able to meet you where you are. If you need prayer, you need somebody just to call you. Uh, you need somebody to bring you a meal or whatever. Just give us, get, reach out to us. 
privately if you wish and let us know. But in the meantime, we love you so much and we will see you next Sunday. God bless you.